soon after the Japanese arrived on Guadalcanal that it was quite obvious they were going to do some building and the only thing they could be building was an airfield. I had quite a large squad of scouts keeping a very detailed check on it and every new hut they put up we found out what was in it or every new gun we worked out what the position was. The Japanese knew Clemens was there. They hunted for him. For months he lived on terror route and good luck. He walked in streams to avoid bloodhounds. Still, Clemens kept sending in reports, waiting impatiently for the Allies to take action. That's a lot went through one's brain, and so many sensations of fear and no help in sight. And I couldn't see any coming for a very long time. On August 6th, Japanese workers set up beacons along their nearly finished airstrip. Then drank sake in celebration. Martin Clemens despaired. In his diary he wrote, Is nothing going to happen after all? The next morning, August 7th, 1942, Allied ships began shelling the beach at Guadalcanal. Neither side really wanted this island. To the Japanese, Guadalcanal was just another step south. But the Allies could not let them take it. And so Harry Horsman and 11,000 other Marines found themselves heading toward shore to fight a battle that had to be won on an island that didn't really matter. We were greatly relieved to find out that nobody was firing at us once we got a foot on shore. Where the hell was the enemy? The landing was a cakewalk. The Japanese construction units at the airstrip ran for the hills, leaving the Marines to unload their supplies in what seemed like peace. Thayer Sol was the Marine documentary filmmaker on Guadalcanal. We came in with the first wave, no opposition of course, and then some officers said, here, you aren't doing anything, put that camera down and come and help move these boxes. We came up here with the absolute irreducible minimum of supplies. We were desperately in need of food, ammunition, everything else. Fortunately, uh, the naval bombardment had done only superficial damage and scared the Japs out, but they left a whole great big uh, locker full of all kinds of canned goods, tons of rice, of course. And then also, I have to tell you about the the beer that we found, there were cases and cases of this stuff in one liter bottles. And the fellows tried it and they said it was terrible. And the language officer looked at it and he said, well, I'm not surprised, it's fly spray. <laughs> From his hideout in the hills, Martin Clemens watched the Marines swarming over the beach. His months of starvation and fear were finally over. It took me an awful lot of thought to realize that I really had come down and I wasn't stuck in the bush forever. But we then had to face up to the problem of how we managed to contact the Americans. And uh, I said, well, there's only one thing to do, and that's to form up in two lines and we'll fly our Union Jack and we'll just march down the beach. One morning, a Marine sentry beheld an amazing sight. Two ranks of minimally clad islanders, rifles on shoulders, led by one starving white man in tattered clothing and one small dog. The sentry raised his rifle, but he didn't shoot. And I tried to say something to him, but nothing happened. My mouth wouldn't speak. Clemens was soon given the job of supplying the Marines with scouts. His days as a spy were over. The Marines occupied only a small fraction of the island, but it was the crucial fraction. They had the unfinished airstrip. 
Vandegrift wrote home, We have the place we set out to take. The fighting is now over. But the fighting was not over. It would last for six full months. At the Japanese base in Rabaul, 600 miles away, life was not greatly disturbed by the landing. Yamamoto expected to wipe the Marines off the island with one brush of the armored sleeve. He immediately ordered a decisive counterattack by both sea and air. Fighter pilot Saburo Sakai was part of the raid. One of Japan's leading aces, Sakai had already shot down 54 enemy planes. After nearly four hours, he reached the Allied landing force of 60 ships. We had never seen such a large enemy fleet. How magnificent, I thought. A swarm of American fighters zoomed off aircraft carriers to meet the threat. Sakai soon squared off with an enemy pilot. He and I got into a one-on-one -on -one dogfight. I aimed and shot at the Grumman from behind. Suddenly his plane slowed down. Engine damage. And then I saw something terrible. I saw for the first time a wounded opponent who was tormented by my efforts to kill him and the possibility of death. How sad, I thought. But then I thought, this is war. You've got to do this. So I dropped back behind him, aimed and squeezed off a burst of my 20 millimeter cannon. His canopy blew up. I prayed for this man whose face I had seen so clearly. Sakai next attacked a group of eight dive bombers. One I shot at went down. At the same instant, their bullets began jolting me. My canopy exploded with tremendous force. Got shot, I thought. Then I spun down. The inside of my head turned pure white. I thought, killed in action, killed in action, killed in action. I'd made others go through this many times, and now it was my turn. Sakai managed to gain control of his plane. Though horribly mutilated and drenched in his own blood, he flew for five more hours and landed at dusk, back home in Rabaul. Even as Sakai's squadron limped home, a Japanese striking force was steaming south. The next 36 hours would bring one of the most humiliating defeats in American naval history. A defeat caused by a brilliant admiral, Gunichi Makawa, and an incredible chain of Allied blunders. The mistakes began early. An Australian search pilot sighted the Japanese fleet but no one received his report for eight hours. An American admiral took aircraft carriers away from the area. Another admiral assumed the Japanese would only attack by air. A third admiral sailed off to a meeting. While Makawa, still undetected, raced at flank speed for a night attack. Corato Yoshie had joined the Navy at 17. He now operated searchlights on Makawa's flagship, the Chokai. We were very nervous at dinner because we knew we'd be facing the enemy soon. I wasn't exactly scared, but the tension certainly took my appetite away. But I was division chief, and I didn't want to make the young sailors even more nervous. So I ate everything. The Allied commander had made the mistake of dividing his force into two groups to the east of nearby Sabo Island. Undetected, Makawa crept closer and closer to the southern group. 
sliding by an American lookout ship at whispering distance. Everyone was in their battle positions. The only sound we could hear was the screws of the ship moving through the water. At 1.38 a.m., Makawa began firing torpedoes at ships that still didn't know he was there. You could see red, yellow, and blue in the sky. Although it was right in the middle of the fighting, I thought, how beautiful. In four minutes, the Australian cruiser Canberra took 24 direct hits, igniting a tremendous bonfire amidships. Bert Warren was four levels below deck when smoke began to surge through the ship. Suddenly everything started to go down, the lights started to go down. We were losing revolutions from our engines and everything was going dead. Then we had to find our way out through a darkened ship. All you could think of was to get some fresh air. This became a thing of prime importance in the mind, is to be able to breathe. Not just to survive, but to breathe. Warren finally reached open air, only to find the deck strewn with the wounded and dead. In seven minutes, Makawa had devastated the cruisers of the southern group. He now turned toward the northern group, five miles away. Incredibly, the Japanese presence was still unknown. The captains and many crew members of all three American cruisers were literally asleep. Petty Officer Leonard Jocelyn was in his bunk aboard the USS Quincy. When General Quarters sounded, I jumped out of my bed and into my clothes and up the lighters I went to the signal bridge. And then a row of shells went right by, right across the bow of our ship. Then a row of shells up to the stern of our ship. And we could see them coming. And they were, they were just like red lanterns coming right straight at us. And we, it was coming, it seemed to me like it was coming right straight at me. The Quincy somehow managed to return fire on the Chokai. But soon the Japanese bombardment became overwhelming. I says, everybody down. And when it was laying down, uh, the, uh, one of the officers came out of the pilot house on the other side of the ship, and he came out, they said, let's be men, not mice. Well, I thought, how oh, I'd like to be a mouse. And <laughs> he no more said it when he got hit with a shell. All three cruisers in the northern group were soon reduced to flaming ruins. Makawa now controlled the sea. Close by were 22 defenseless American transports, still half-loaded with food and ammunition desperately needed by the Marines on Guadalcanal. Thayer Soul was on one of the transports. You could hear the thunder rolling across from the gunfire. And then it was quiet, it was dark, and one plane up above us, and they dropped a flare, and all the transports were silhouetted against that light. And we knew the Japanese ships must be over there. And Captain Perkins said, well, this is it. Nice to know you fellows, the shells are on the way. But no shells were on the way. Makawa could have ended the entire campaign by destroying the transports, but he failed to finish the job. Convinced his victory was complete, he headed home. On this night of Allied blunders, the final mistake belonged to the Japanese.
all the same, the Battle of Savo Island was one of the most crushing losses in the history of the U.S. Navy. In less than 40 minutes, Makawa sank four of the five Allied cruisers, damaged the fifth, and killed over a thousand Allied sailors. On the Solomon Islands, even the first week of war shattered the old colonial picture of the world. Tom Tatulu had grown up on Guadalcanal and been educated by the British. We were taught by the missionaries that the British Empire is the greatest and the most strongest empire after the Roman Empire. And then the war broke out with Japan and we are told that uh, uh, not to be scared of the Japanese uh, because the little yellow man is no match to the, uh, the British Navy and uh, the Allied forces. Tom Tutulu, like many Solomon Islanders, worked with the Allies. Tutulu was a porter. When all this uh, modern equipment and the transport arrived, it's so amazing that we just can't understand it. And it really uh, affects our lives, you see. A change overnight. The Solomon Islanders assisted in what was now the Americans' critical task, finishing the airstrip. The Battle of Savo Island had crippled the Navy. So the Marines were totally vulnerable to attack by air and sea. The airstrip was still a muddy morass of ruts and bumps, but it was the Marines' only hope for defending themselves. Before the war, Arville Jones had worked at Universal Studios. He now found himself a long way from Hollywood. We arrived at Henderson Field uh, to set up the airfield and get it operational. We were totally unprotected there. Until we got planes of our own in the, in the air, the, uh, the Japanese planes could just waltz in and attack us anytime they felt like it. That was very scary. On August 20th, the Americans again spotted planes flying low over the airfield. We thought it was another of those bombings that we've been having and strafing attacks. And uh, we look up and here is the ocean blue airplanes of the United States of America. And we started to holler, they're ours, they're ours. The Americans were not the only ones who valued the airstrip. After crushing the Allied Navy at Savo Island, the Japanese now set out to take back Guadalcanal. 900 crack soldiers landed just east of the airfield. A young sergeant from Hokkaido, Sadanobu Okada, was one of those soldiers. The idea of the United States forces taking away the airfield that Japan had built, that was really humiliating. The leader of the Japanese force was Colonel Kiyoano Ichiki. Ichiki was a tough and tested commander. He was also supremely confident. But he had reason to be confident. Japanese soldiers had overwhelmed the Allies in every previous battle. I think the Ichiki unit was the most elite unit in the entire Japanese army. We, the initiated into battle, you might say we were like Hollywood High School. We were going up against the Los Angeles Raiders. On August 20th, Harry Horsman and the other Marines dug in on the bank of a sluggish river they called the Tenaru. The Marines didn't have long to wait. The Cheeky did not scout American positions, and he did not try to avoid them. We just naturally assumed that we could break the enemy line if we charged in a night assault. The 
the Japanese uh, made their initial charge with this wild screaming. It was, it was eerie. I was hit in the mouth by a shotgun. I heard a faint sound, like a click. Then I felt a bullet. My jawbone was tough enough to block the bullet, but then I had to dig it out with my fingers. When the first casualty that I had experience with was a chap by the name of Rogers, and when he was shot, his, uh, his brain and his blood uh, spat it all over another fellow and myself. There was sort of a little bit to the rear of him. Uh, and I think now the only thing that I can remember was that Jesus Rogers got it. Ichiki sent waves of attackers crashing against the American lines, using bayonets against machine guns. Tactics which had always served the Japanese well. When daylight came, uh, the sight before us was almost unbelievable. There were hundreds of mangled bodies over there. Uh, and uh, we took, I suppose, great satisfaction in our work. Ichiki's elite detachment had been annihilated. Ichiki hurried back to camp in shame. He tore his regiment's flag to tatters, burned the scraps, and committed harakiri. Of course, I'd never seen enemy dead before. Most of the people there had, and um, it, it was a shattering experience. And I remember thinking at the time how fortunate we were that we weren't there lying dead. We took very, very, very few prisoners. Uh, several of those who were tried to be taken prisoner uh, killed themselves right there on the spot. Some took uh, shots at their Rescuers, if you want to call us rescuers, at that time. I think our immediate reaction was that we realized that this was going to be a different kind of war. This was to be a war of savagery. It set the tone for the rest of the war in the Pacific. For the Americans on Guadalcanal, loneliness was the least of their problems. Victory at Teneru River did not feed the Marines. The lack of supplies soon became agonizing. Rations were short. Supplies were short. Everything was short, except the rain, except the bugs, except the malaria that made its appearance, dysentery. You were fighting these elements as well as the enemy. It was a total hellhole. We lived in squalor, absolute squalor. We slept in our little pup tents, floorless pup tents, on our back, in the mud. Breakfast was thin gruel, and the other meal was rice. Socks and underwear were distant memories. The malaria caseload numbered in the thousands. The sick, hungry, exhausted marines seem to be sliding toward their ruin. General Vandegrift wrote, day by day, I watched my marines deteriorate in the flesh. One night, some of the first broadcasts of Tokyo Rose came on the radio and she played the latest beautiful music of Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey. Hello, you fighting orphans of the Pacific. This is all request night. But I've got a crime. She'd say, don't you wish you were in the arms of your lover in Griffith Park tonight? She'd say sweet things to us, you know, and then she'd get very dramatic and she'd say, you Marines, you fifth Marines on the Mentanaka'u, we know right where you are, and tomorrow you'll be dead. 
For the Marines, surrounded on their small corner of the island, there was nothing to do but wait for the day when the enemy would come. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what was coming. And what was going to follow. As summer turned into fall, the Japanese began loading ships for an overwhelming new offensive. After the shock at Tenaru, the first defeat for the Japanese army, Yamamoto realized that this remote jungle island was of immense importance. Night after night, he shipped massive reinforcements to Guadalcanal for what he hoped would be the decisive battle in the Pacific War. Even as the Japanese massed on the island, General Vandegrift received a message from his commanding officer. It said, the Navy, fearful of losing more ships, could no longer support the Marines on Guadalcanal. The Marines were on their own. And a handwritten note accompanied the official one. If worst came to worst, Vandegrift was authorized to surrender. Fifty years earlier, the Marines on Guadalcanal faced impending disaster. They controlled only a shallow arc of land on a large island. The Japanese ruled the sea, cutting off Allied supplies. But the Americans had one trump card, the pockmarked, rutted track called Henderson Field. Whoever held Henderson Field held the key to victory. The airfield was called an unsinkable aircraft carrier until the night that Admiral Yamamoto's battleships tried to sink it. On the island uh, on October 12th was my birthday. I had now reached the advanced age, through a lot of good luck, to be 19 years old. And lo and behold, about 1 a.m. on the 13th, these tremendous blasts all of a sudden occurred, seemingly to us out of nowhere. Boom, boom, boom. And a big flash of light rose up out of the uh, iron bottom sound against those low hanging clouds, and a staccato pounded against those things. And this went on louder, like, like freight trains whizzing over your head. And I thought, Jesus, I'll never live to see my 19th year. Hell of a time. I only have one day at being 19. General Vandegrift wrote, Until someone has experienced shelling, he cannot easily grasp the sensation of helplessness, fear, and shock. A man comes close to himself at such times. The next morning, the Marines crawled out of their foxholes to find Henderson Field a wreck. Their radio station destroyed, most of their plane fuel blown up. A hit on a ration dump had spangled the landscape with shards of spam. Most of the American planes were either damaged or destroyed. They fired 973 14-inch shells at us that night and they tore that airfield up, they tore our airplanes up, they tore everything up. With American planes disabled, the Japanese were free to land troops for a new offensive. The next day, the Marines woke to a humiliating spectacle. A huge task force calmly unloading soldiers in plain view of the Americans. The Japanese are landing men, equipment, artillery, of which we could do nothing about. We were powerless at this point. And we were given gunny sacks, which we were told had the last of the rations you're going to be issued and the last of the ammunition. It wasn't too good a uh, future at that point.
the Japanese army soon launched its offensive, sideways. Their plan was complex, to march all the way around the Marines and attack from behind. On October 16th, the Sendai Division began their march. They ended up chopping trails through a trackless jungle, completely losing some units and exhausting the rest. After three days, they sharpened bayonets, expecting to fight the next morning, but couldn't find the enemy for five more days. Finally, on October 24th, at least some of the Japanese force attacked the ridge just south of Henderson Field. The Japanese outnumbered the Marines by three to one. But they charged straight at fortified positions. These dubious tactics seemed to work. After days of furious fighting, the Japanese took the crest of a ridge west of the airfield. On October 25th, they radioed Banzai, right wing captured airfield. The report was premature. Marine artillery blasted the Japanese off the ridge. The Americans surged forward and the battle was over. 2,200 Japanese lost their lives. American deaths numbered just 84. For the Japanese army, the aftermath of the battle for Henderson Field was as bad as the bloodbath itself. The Sendai Division had to retreat the way it had come through 30 miles of swamp and jungle. This time, it would be without food. One officer wrote in his diary, October 27th, we haven't eaten for three days. I have to rest every two meters. October 29th, I don't know how many men must be left behind today. The soldiers abandoned their equipment. They started to eat leaves, bark, roots. The entire Japanese force was starving. They began to call Guadalcanal the island of death. I wonder how long this will last. It makes me feel like a little bird in the rain. Artillery officer Akio Tani was one of those starving on Guadalcanal. Very often, we would smell the delicious scent of the food cooking at the American base there when the wind wafted our way. I received a packet of black tea just one time. I didn't drink the tea. Drinking it would have been wasteful. I ate it. As the Japanese soldiers retreated, starving and defenseless, many were taken prisoner. Most of the Japanese army soldiers were in very bad shape. Instead of fighting, they are looking for food. And so uh, when we captured them, uh, they were very grateful that we were feeding them and at the POW compound. Roy Wihata, a second generation Japanese American, was assigned to military intelligence. Over 20 years before, his parents left Japan with a dream. They came to America to find a better life. After Pearl Harbor, they lost their farm. They lost everything but an album of photos. Roy's family was sent to an internment camp in Arizona, while Roy was in Guadalcanal fighting for his country. I thought that I was doing the correct thing at all times, and 
There was no hesitation on my part to even fire at any Japanese uh, soldier if they were on the other side of the front line. On Guadalcanal, we had to volunteer to interrogate Japanese prisoners. The Japanese commanders never expected their soldiers to surrender. They hadn't even told their soldiers not to talk. So it was very easy to get information from the prisoners. The uh, early prisoners were bleeding in their mouth, and I asked them, why, uh, how come you, uh, you have uh, injuries around your mouth? He said that the uh, Marines used to uh, use their rifle butt to take out all these gold teeth that they were had in their mouth. So this is how I found out they were treated poorly by some of the Marine soldiers. We took some prisoners, and a guard was placed on them. In the middle of the night, he shot them. Why? He got tired of standing watch, so he shot them. We knew that they didn't try to escape. They couldn't. So and in this type of savagery, one reverts to an almost barbaric, everyday type of existence. And you do things under these conditions that nobody in their right mind or normally would do. They probably and us, but we did them. The island of quiet villages, after only a few months of war, had become almost unrecognizable to Tom Tutulu and the other Solomon Islanders. When we went to war with the Allies, as a porter, or as a spy, or as a scout, uh, we just don't understand uh, what it's all about. Uh, this an American war, it's a Japanese war maybe, but it's not a uh, Solomon Island war, you see. But as they landed on our shores, uh, then we are caught in it. And of course, we, we think that we're helping the Allies without realizing what it's all about. In November 1942, the majestic battleship Kirishima led a powerful fleet of 61 ships toward Guadalcanal. With the fleet went the Empire's final hopes to recapture the island. Their plan called for the fleet to bombard Henderson Field. Eleven troop transports would then land 7,000 fresh soldiers on the island. The Japanese command wrote, the coming naval battle is the fork in the road which leads to victory, for them or for us. Mishiharu Shinya from Tokyo had enlisted only because every young man in Japan had to. Stuart Mordock from Indiana had dreamed of the Navy and the imaginary event called war. These two young men, worlds apart, were about to meet in combat. We knew the Japanese were going to strike that night. The intelligence reports were just so definite. I can remember from the island came uh, the fragrance of flowers, the tropical flowers. And I didn't feel like, you know, going into battle. An innovation called radar gave the Allies the advantage of surprise, in theory. But the American commander did not trust the newfangled instrument. He knew where the Japanese ships were, but he didn't fire. He didn't fire for eight long minutes. Ships that could hit targets 12 miles away came within five miles. 
then two miles, then one, and then less. Suddenly, I could see a line of American cruisers directly in front of us. And so we snapped on our searchlights. Bingo came a searchlight right on the Atlanta. I could still see that light uh, off the port bow, uh, burning a hole right through me. It was just amazing. At that point, I saw the forward guns of the Atlanta swing out so rapidly and fire. In minutes, 13 American and 14 Japanese ships were all firing, almost at random. One of the men doing the firing was Bert Dowdy on the Monson. We were really shooting at anything that moved. I believe we hit our ships, our own ships. Japanese done the same. We hit the Japanese, they hit us. It was just one hell of a brawl. The two formations dissolved into chaos. Opposing ships came so close that sailors shot at each other with machine guns. Mordock's Atlanta was smashed by two full battery salvos from another American ship. Every man on the bridge, including Mordock, was hit. I saw Admiral Scott coming toward me, and I, I, I saw him take his, uh, his last step, boom. And that was it uh, for him. He, he was killed right there. Shinya's Akatsuki attracted an avalanche of fire from five enemy ships, including the crippled Atlanta. Every part of the ship became unstable. It started to quiver and shake. And then the ship began to sink, and we all had to jump into the sea. On Bert Dowdy's Monson, the captain thought he was being fired on by friendly ships. He switched on recognition lights, and the destroyer was immediately struck by 37 shells. It was just one hell of a bang, and that was it. I got hit, and I just went out. I lay there unconscious all night long. I didn't get off the ship. Only a few miles away, Stuart Mordock was trapped on the bridge of the Atlanta. Shells kept exploding all around him. Mordock, in panic, vaulted over the bridge rail, a 20-foot drop to the deck. Down I went. And I hit, uh, I'm pretty certain, a, a bunch of dead bodies that, that, on that gun emplacement because I, I heard the noise of their, you know, their lungs, their, their whatever, if it's a... Uh, shattering kind of feeling right that moment that I'd done that. At dawn, seven damaged ships still drifted, burning and smoking on the glassy surface of Iron Bottom Sound. One of them was the Monson where Bert Dowdy was still unconscious, pieces of shrapnel lodged in his skull, and his ship sinking beneath him. His help came in the end from sharks. Three of Dowdy's friends made it off the ship, but the sharks were so terrifying, they finally paddled back to the sinking destroyer. They happened to see somebody move. It was me. And they said, well, for crying out, it's Buddy Burke. They called me Buddy Burke. And I was alive. While Dowdy's buddies got him off the ship, Japanese survivors floated on the surface of Iron Bottom Sound. One of them was Mishiharu Shinya. Many hours passed, and the sea and sky gradually became light. Looking toward the east, 
I saw a small American boat coming slowly toward me. They tried to rescue me, but I blurted out in English, no thanks. Still, you're not really free when you're treading water in the ocean, so eventually I gave up. For us, being captured was extremely shameful, much worse than dying. By afternoon, boats ferried the wounded Americans, including Stuart Mordock, to land. I remember being with the others there, and there was one seaman on a stretcher right by me. Very seriously, why don't you can tell? And uh, I looked at him, he looked at me, and he, he gave me a smile. That was it. I haven't told this before. And I'll, I'll always remember that smile. For both sides, the battle was incredibly costly. The Americans lost two cruisers, seven destroyers, and over 1,700 men. The Imperial Navy, two battleships, one cruiser, three destroyers, and nearly 1,900 men. A standoff. But the next day, that standoff turned into a decisive American victory. Bombers sank seven Japanese troop transports ending the Japanese attempt to reinforce, ending Japanese hopes to retake the island, ending any true possibility of the Japanese holding the South Pacific. After four months of fighting, the Americans had a stranglehold on the island. The Marines turned over their hard-won territory to the Army. The Marines bore little resemblance to the fresh young men who had waded ashore. Their uniforms were in tatters, the men themselves sick, exhausted, worn out. The shock of that leaving Guadalcanal numbed us, and there was no jumping or joy, and nobody with any hilarity. I couldn't believe that reaction when I looked back on it and we just shuffled to load into the Higgins boat and leave this place. As bad as conditions were for the Americans, they were worse for the Japanese. Without food or reinforcements, the remaining soldiers seemed doomed to die on the island. But on three February nights, the Japanese Navy slipped through the curtain of Allied surveillance to steal 11,000 troops away from their fate. The last act of the campaign, like so much before it, was a mix of courage, blunder, and simple luck. When we were pulling out from Guadalcanal, we left a soldier there who was still breathing. I will never forget that. The image of that young soldier just being left there, unconscious but still breathing, that keeps coming back to my mind, even today. For the Marines, after months on the front lines, the next stop was Melbourne. The Australians, Marines agreed, were suitably grateful. You know, the people of Australia were marvelous. Marvelous. Everybody had an adopted family, it seemed, and certainly had girlfriends. Melbourne was the piece of cake, particularly 
the parade in front of all those Aussies like that. People are shouting, God bless you, Yank, you saved Australia. Old ladies would come around, hug you about the neck. Old soldiers from World War I would shake your hand. It brought it all home that what we had done was not in vain. And it was appreciated. In a few months, the name Guadalcanal had gone from obscurity to legend. The campaign turned the war around in a literal sense. Before Guadalcanal, the Japanese always advanced. After Guadalcanal, they were always in retreat. The road now led only one way, toward Japan. On August 15, 1945, Emperor Hirohito broadcast news of Japan's surrender. Japanese soldiers returned home to desolation and even shame. After the war, we were supposed to stop wearing the military uniform, but we have no other clothes. So we just ripped off the insignia and kept wearing the uniform. As long as I was wearing it, I still felt I was a soldier. But there was nothing much to do there. I spent every day in an absent-minded state. From August when the war ended until February, I didn't do any work, I just stayed at home. On the 50th anniversary of the campaign, the now independent nation of the Solomon Islands honored the men who had served in the war. One of those men was Tom Tatula. The very moment I'm, wait I'm waiting for has now arrived. I have received a Solomon Island medal. Another honored guest at the ceremony was former Coast Watcher Martin Clemens reunited with his scouts. How are you? Long time now. Long time. Long time. Long time. Better or worse, the Second World War brought the Solomon Islanders into the civilized world. 